Welcome to another edition of Teach the Geek Interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I'm the founder of Teach the Geek. I work with technical professionals so they can present more effectively, especially in front of non-technical audiences. And you can learn more about that at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. If you're watching this interview on YouTube, remember to like and subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening to the podcast, a review will always be welcome. Today, my guest is Richard Page. He's the founder of the Rich of the Rich Page, providing personal development and leadership training. I'm really le- interested to learn more about his beginnings, like how did an engineer end up as a personal development guru? So let's just jump right into it. Welcome to Teach the Geek Interviews, Richard. Thank you, Neil. So from the bit of research I did on you, I saw that you studied aerospace engineering. So what was the motivation to study that? Well, that's correct, Neil. I uh, I have always had a love for airplanes, rockets, anything that flies, leaves the earth. I've always loved it. I I think that the genesis of my love was really my parents. Both of my parents were avid readers. We had books all over the place. Uh, My father in particular really loved science. So I grew up uh, on Sunday evenings watching, watching National Geographic uh, programs on TV, uh, and he had a he would subscribe to National Geographic magazine and anything science related. He kept it in the house, and so I just developed a love for science. and And my focus has just always been with airplanes and with rockets. I've always wanted to be an astronaut, and I've always wanted to fly, and so that's really where my love started out. Oh, okay. I remember when I was a kid, my father was really big on Star Trek, The Next Generation. We had, we had to watch that every day. And let me tell you something. I hated that show <laughs> because I got no choice. And not only that, but also 60 Minutes on Sundays. And you know, you know what was so crazy about that? Even when I became an adult, I still kept watching 60 Minutes. Like I, like I had to. Like my father wasn't even there anymore. Why, why am I still watching this? I don't care about Mike Wallace and Morley Safer and Ed Bradley. Rest in peace. <laughs> but there I was. Into you, huh, man? <laughs> it was like clockwork every every Sunday evening, seven o'clock. I'm I'm, I'm sitting there watching six minutes. I'm Mike Wallace. I'm Morley Safer. I'm Ed Bradley. I don't care. I'm watching this. <laughs> there I am. I cause I know I know my father. Even in the, even in the summers when it was reruns, that man was still watching. Like man, you already saw this. <laughs> that's excellent that oh, is man. excellent oh, but I, I, I also saw that you got uh you actually studied systems engineering too so what was the yes. motivation to do that well what happened was my company i was working for a company uh north of grumman uh at the time in uh in melbourne florida and i as you said i already had my aerospace engineering uh degree but what happened was um, in order for the North of Grumman Corporation to get a further contract, the government put in requirements that they had to have a certain number or percentage of systems engineers, and they were short. So they said to us, hey, if any of you guys want to get a degree in systems engineering, we'll pay for it. So I talked to my wife and I talked to some of the people that I work with, and they said, why not go for it? So so the younger guys, um, such as myself, I was in my early 30s at the time. We both kind of looked at this and said, you know what? Well, why don't we just go for a master's de- degree for free? We already have a job. We're going to get elevated in our position. And we'll also have a higher level degree in case we decide not to stay here. And so that was it uh, for me. I, I didn't even know what systems engineering was, but I knew it was an opportunity to get a free master's degree. And so that's why I went for it. Do you know what systems engineering is now? I still don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I've asked other people that question too, you know. <laughs> what is systems engineering? I'm like, I'm not really sure, but from what I understand, it's kind of like you're able to talk with all the other engineering disciplines, but, but what it, it actually is, I've never really been clear on. Yeah, you know, Neil, it is. You're right about that. It's one of those uh, amorphous <laughs> uh, degrees or way of ways of looking at things. And I think maybe that's really a better way of describing it. It it it's a way of looking at things and of organizing things. And so uh, when we were going for the for the degree, 
uh, we did, we learned uh, about engineering in a lot of different areas. I know, again, my specialty was in, was in obviously aerodynamics and aerodynamic performance. I looked at airplane performance. We worked on a military program um, called Joint Stars. And so, so I focused on, on the airplane's performance, but all the other guys in, in the program, they were all uh, electronics people. The, the program was sticking this, um, this radar, this ground reviewing radar onto an old 707. And we actually used it in Desert Storm. It was still in the developmental phase during Desert Storm in the early 90s. And so the idea was <clears throat> with systems engineering, what we learned was how do you how are you able to one recognize how a system works and then utilize that system so that it works in many different functions? So we did a lot of studies. I, I learned things about um like queuing as an example. Um running a program for cars that are at a stoplight, as an example. What is the most efficient um, uh, setup for the stoplight so that cars can move in multiple directions and, and calculating the time that it takes and, and looking at something as, as silly as, as fluid dynamics and how that also uh, ties in with, with calculating the performance of a stoplight. I mean, it was some of the things were really interesting, but um, I'll be honest with you. In my years after that, uh, I've never used it. Not one time have I ever used my systems degree, but it looked great on my resume. It worked <laughs> out for me. <laughs> All right. I mean, you didn't have to pay for it. So I guess what was the harm in the end of the day? Just some time and maybe some 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 papers and, and that's right. You had to take that's yeah, no problem. <laughs> So, you know, working as an engineer, Richard, what did you like and dislike about it? The thing that I loved, I, I am a geek. I, I am a geek. I, I really do. I love science. So for me, especially being an, an, an aerospace engineer and working on airplane uh, performance uh, issues, the, the fun for me was being able to solve problems. I love using my brain to solve problems. I love fixing things uh, at home. Uh, obviously, at work as an engineer, I don't do any mechanical work. I sit at a desk and use a computer. But I've had the opportunity to help to solve problems, and that has been so much fun to me. When I, when I when when my boss uh, presents me with an issue and says, "Rich, here's something that we need to work on. The customer is having a problem with this or that." What can we do about it? And being able to sit down and do that, or, or even in the early days on the Joint Stars program, uh, my job was to, I worked, we, we created the flight manual for this new airplane system. And so we started from scratch. It had never been done for this particular airplane. And so we had to put the, the pieces of the puzzle together and make sure that this, that this flight manual provided the flight crew with the information that they needed. So that meant that we had to work with the flight crews. And that was fun also, working with the people that were going to use the product that you were building. That was so much fun to me, getting to know these guys uh, on, on kind of a personal level. So it was the combination of the, of the engineering and at the same time, the personal connection putting those two things together. Well, maybe that's the use of systems engineering then. <laughs> I put the personal system uh, along with the technical system and making sure that it worked out and it made sense. And, and I think those are some of the things that I actually enjoyed. The things that I did not like was, you know, this, this almost sounds silly. It can get competitive. You know, when you're working in a, in a big company, there's always competition. Um, I think amongst us, the guys that work together in a, in our group, again, we were in the, in the um, in the aerodynamic performance group. So there were only about six of us. We we didn't compete with each other. We all had specific roles that we were supposed to to um, uh, to work out. But among other areas, every group it seemed was vying for. Um, the, the the best level. How can they get best known? 
How can they get the best budget? How can they look good in front of the whoever the leader was at the time? That kind of stuff, I hate it. I, I hate um, uh, organizational competition. Uh, uh, that kind of, I don't like office politics. To me, it's such a waste of time and it saps you of energy. Uh, I, I just, I enjoyed when I had a chance to just meet with people. We talked about problems and we and we came to a solution uh, for what those problems was. That was a lot of fun for me. Yeah, I'm, I've never been a fan of office politics myself, which is probably why I don't work in an office anymore. <laughs> You're a smart man. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I stopped watching 60 Minutes, too. <laughs> <laughs> It, Richard, when it came to the your engineering career, did when you moved up or if you ever moved up within an organization, is that something that you were seeking to do or something that others were pushing you to do? And if it was something you were seeking to do, how did you go about doing it? Uh, no, <clears throat> in reality, I, I really just I, I'm one of those guys that I just like doing what I like doing. Uh, especially in terms of uh, leadership positions, it's not something that I chase after. Um, I remember my boss telling me several times uh, when I started working on this this program, this Joint Stars program. Um, I only had two years in the company. I was the I was the youngest person in the com, well in the in our area, and I obviously had the least amount of experience. So he kind of took me under his wing. And he spent a lot of time with me teaching me how do I use the computer system? Um, how do I how do I use uh, the, the the programs that did the performance calculations? So he spent a lot of time with me, really raising me up. So then when other guys joined with more that were older and had more experience, they were actually behind me. And so he would ask me to stand in for him at meetings and things. So so I became very well recognized and 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 I'll say this and respected in the organization. And so when people had a question, if my boss wasn't available, they would come to me. I, I don't know how the other guys felt about that. No, we never talked about it. No one ever, you know, gave me the side eye or anything like that. We We just didn't function that way. But uh, honestly, I'll tell you, Neil, it, it made me a little bit nervous because they were kind of uh, elevating me to that level. And I, I really didn't want it. And so what happened was my boss wound up, he, he retired. He, um, he's one of those guys, he just loves the work. He loved the work. He loved airplanes. And that was what he wanted to do. He hated the, um, the managerial stuff that he had to do. He didn't like time cards. Uh, he didn't like planning budgets and all that kind of stuff. So when the opportunity came for him, he said, he told me, I remember we, we, we sat down for a few minutes and he said, Rich, uh, I'm out of here. I've had enough of this place. I can't take it anymore. He said, I ran the numbers, right? Engineering talk, I ran the numbers and, uh, and I talked to my wife and, um, and that's it, I'm leaving. He said, I don't want a um, I don't want a party. I don't want a luncheon. This is just on Friday. I'm not going to be here. <laughs> he said, I want you now to 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 lead this group, um, you know, in, in, in a functional way. They the higher ups put a manager over us. I wasn't the manager, but functionally, I kind of uh, ran things and it. I tell you, Neil, it wasn't something that I wanted. I just, I was like him. I just wanted to do the work. I just love doing the work. So, um, so for me, just doing the work was really what I wanted to do. I, it, to me, that other stuff is such a drain. I, I understand that I'm still close to him now. So here we are 20 years after that time. And, uh, and I still keep in contact with him whenever I'm in the area. Uh, we we hang out and grab a bite together, uh, and I understand why he did what he did because that that management position can be a big time drain on your life. Yeah, one hundred percent. So it sounds like, well, it sounded like what when you you took on this position, this might have been something that 
you weren't all that keen on doing, but you took it on anyway. What I'm really interested in is, you know, you mentioned that you had a manager that was over you. What was the relationship like with that person? Yeah, it, it was great. Um, what happened was when I started working for the Grumman Corporation, um, I came straight from school and we were baked. We were in, we were based in uh, in New York in a place called Long Island in uh, in New York City, and then what happened was this project opened up in Melbourne, Florida. So I moved. So this was I had been in the company for two years. So I'm 24 years old. I moved down from um, from New York down to Melbourne, Florida by myself, and the project for the company was 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 fairly new. So my boss Tom had been down there for five years working in the development phase. It was just he and another guy in our area, but he was one of the top level people at the company in performance engineering. So when things got, when 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 the company recognized, okay, this program is really taking off now, we need more people. So they asked people uh, in, in Long Island and nobody wanted to go. And the reason was, was because everybody else was older, they had homes, they had families, and nobody wanted to go. So I'm this young guy. I mean, I lived with, at home with my family. So I said, I'll go if you'll take me. <laughs> well, they had nobody else. So I went down there. So I meet this guy, Tom. And again, he was, everybody knew him uh, where I worked, but I didn't know him. He just took me under his wing. And uh, and and we became, he, he was like, I call him my career father. Because he, he, you know, I'm this green, don't know anything kid, but he never treated me like, like I was an idiot, you know, and I made mistakes, but he corrected me. Uh, and what I learned about him was that if you give your best and you do things as best as you can do it, he respected you. If you demonstrated respect, for the work, he just wanted you to give a hundred percent. You make mistakes, welcome to humanity. He said, "He, we can always correct a mistake. What I don't want you to do is to not try. Try it. We'll work together." He he had a rule for us that when we would uh, do step into a new area, we would run a, a program. We run a program and 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 get results. But before we accepted the results from the program, we had to do a hand calculation. And he said, your hand calculation should match what the computer ran. If it doesn't, something's wrong. Either you're wrong or the computer is wrong. But it means something's wrong. And you need to figure out why those two numbers don't match. So yeah, he was he he was he was my manager. He was his top level in what he did. And I had a tremendous, and I still do have a tremendous amount of respect for him as a leader uh, and as a and as a person in this career field. Well, it's great that he didn't give you a hard time if you were to make a mistake, because I find that a lot of people have really short memories. At one point, you were a new person, too, and I'm sure you made a bunch of mistakes as well. Luckily for you, I can't go back and, and count all the mistakes you made but <laughs> because I wasn't there. But I'm I'm almost certain that you weren't perfect when you first came into the field as well, and people had to help you along. So you really should pay it forward and, and do the same for the people that are under you. So I'm really glad that you had that experience. You know, Richard, I mean, I mentioned in the intro that you started the Rich page. So maybe you could tell us more about that. What prompted you to start it and, and what is it? Sure. So the Rich page uh, allows me to do uh, something that I really love doing, where my heart is truly focused in. And that's in teaching. That's in training. Um for the rich page, what I do is I have I I take it upon myself to find areas where where organizations and individuals have a need for uh, for training or sometimes a, just a message. I hate to just say a motivational message, but an idea that will give you uh, a, a spark, a spark of information. That base that's based on also a foundation that you can actually stand on and build upon. Um, so that's really what the rich what the rich page is. So uh, under the rich page, uh, I've written a book called "Okay, Now I've Got It." 
uh, again, it, and what it does, what the book talks about is it gives you an understanding of why it's so important for you to understand who you are, your personal identity. Um, under the Rich page, I also, as I said, I, I do teachings and I do public speaking and I do those types of things simply to be able to reach people and to uh, and to motivate them to do the things that they are supposed to do. And, you know, Neil, and, and I'm sure that you've experienced this also, especially in the in the engineering field. And if you've ever worked for a company, you know that when you join the company, you have this degree from a university and you're excited and wow, I did it. I mean, I'm an electrical engineer, I'm an aerospace engineer, I'm gonna do great things. And then you sit down and your boss says, okay, this is what you're going to do. And you're thinking, but I thought I was going to do that. No, this is what you're going to do. This is your assignment. And you find out, and 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 as you you're doing things on your own, you come to find out that um you have to follow directions <laughs> and you have to do what somebody else tells you to do with that aspect of your life. And I came to a place after working for, for two Fortune 500 companies um, for over 30 years of my life that I really needed to step into doing what I was truly created to do. And that is to teach people and to help people to learn and to help encourage them to be what they were indeed created to be. That's, that's wonderful, Richard, to, to hear that. And, you know, you're right. I mean, I, certainly when I worked in, in corporate America, yeah, you're, you're told what you're going to be working on. And maybe that's another reason I don't work in corporate America anymore. <laughs> I don't want to be told what to do. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> it's really, it's really nice to be able to figure out what you want to do, what you're good at, what the work that you're willing to do. And then, then what you need to figure out is what market's willing to pay for it. That's, that's, the, that's the other part you really got to figure out. That's the hard part. Yeah, yeah. Because you, I'm doing what I want to do. I'm following my passion. But yeah, you're passionately right. broke. You, know, right. you, you don't want me that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's not a good look. So, uh, you know, uh, Richard, you mentioned public speaking. So maybe we could, we could transition into that. You know, when it comes to public speaking, is that something you've always been good at? And if not, what'd you do to get better at it? No, it wasn't something that I ever even thought about. You know, some people grow up and they're, I'm going to be a lawyer. You know, you know how it is. When you see little kids that talk a lot, their parents say, they're going to be a lawyer one day because we see on TV, lawyers give these big speeches and then we think that's what being an, a lawyer is. It's not really. Uh, but no, it's the public speaking is not something that I ever thought about. Um, one day uh, at work, again, down in Florida, uh, we were working on this project. Um, the government wanted to put, um, uh, the military wanted to put what we call this missile warning system uh, on the airplane. We could calculate the performance of the airplane after the sensor is on, but we couldn't calculate what was going to happen by putting these things on, on, the, uh, on the airplane. So what we had to do was we had to get uh, another group to do the actual calculation. They did some called a CFD, computation of fluid dynamics, to see what would happen to the airflow on the airplane. And then what we were going to do is, based on those results, we would calculate how it affected the performance of the airplane. And we were going to give a presentation to our customer, the United States Air Force, on how things were going. So we're doing all this work. I was working closely with, with the group up north that was doing the CFD analysis. And um, and my boss, he was going to make the presentation. Well, about a week before the presentation, my boss's son got into a car accident up in New York. So he had to go up there to be with him. He wasn't seriously injured. Um, So he's going to go up there and he's not going to be here. And so he says, I, I said, so, Tom, what's going to happen? Are they going to cancel it? And he said, no, we can't cancel it. They're coming here. To, they're not just going to look at our section. They're looking at everything else that's happening, too. He says, you're going to do the presentation. And so and now I'm, I'm 26, 27 at the time. I'd never done anything like that before. And I said, Tom, I, there's no way I could do it. He says, he says, Rich, let me tell you something. 
He says, you can do this. Here's the thing. What you're afraid of, you're afraid of giving the, the technical part of the presentation. But let me tell you something. These guys don't really care about the technical part. He says, they're going to have a couple of technical experts. And so what you do is you put in, a well, I'll help you make the slides because everything was PowerPoint back then. He says, you're going to put in a few technical things, throw in a few charts. That'll make the technical guys happy. But he says, Rich, here's what you do is tell the story. He said, the guys that sign the checks, all they care about is the story. You talk about what happened. You talk about what we went through to get to the decision that we're making and the recommendations that you're making. And when you do that, they'll be happy. You're going to satisfy everybody. You can do this. And I'll tell you, Neil, I was scared. I was really scared because it was a technical presentation to full bird colonels, the people that signed the checks, plus the leaders of, of our division were all going to be sitting there. And so what happened was he helped me work on the presentation. Um, we, did a, we did a dry run. And then on the day of the presentation, the uh, our leader explained that the that 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 the manager that had that the technical lead, my boss Tom, why he couldn't be there, and so they asked me to fill in for him. Everybody was really cool, and I did it, and and it was great. And that kind of awakened something in me. And and here's the thing that I think is is the key, Neil, for for anyone that's watching. Yes, it was a technical presentation, but the key that it showed me was that you can do anything that you really set your mind to. He, my, my manager taught me that it wasn't even really so much about the technical aspect, but it was about telling a story. And that understanding has changed the way I have, I have provided training uh, and teaching, even in technical courses that people understand things better when you put it in the format of a story. You're absolutely right, Richard. I mean, when I first started giving presentations, I didn't recognize the importance of storytelling when it came to technical presentations, but especially if you're talking to a non-technical audience, it's yes. even more important because yes. a lot of that technical stuff, a lot of technical jargon, you got to throw that out the window because they aren't going right. to know what any of that means. <laughs> so you, be you better put it in the form of a story, especially if you're talking to decision makers, Yes. Man, the answer is no, if they don't understand. So you better you better figure it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for people who are watching or listening to our conversation, Richard, what would and they, and they want to get better at giving presentations, what would your number one tip be? I think my number one tip would be know them. Know your audience. Uh I've I've been blessed with the opportunity to give uh a, a presentations to uh, to big engineering conferences uh, for the Boeing company. I worked for the Boeing company and I've done uh, two presentations at their <clears throat> uh, at, at two of their engineering conferences. And with my understanding of who was going to be there, you know, not down to the individual level, but in understanding this, these were flight operations people. So I could speak to them uh, from a flight operations point of view because that was my area. Um, with, with, with the example that I talked about many, many years ago, I knew who I was speaking to. They were here for a specific project that we were working on. Some of them were financial people. Some of them were technical people. But I understood that these were Air Force guys. So I could speak to them in, no, in in that language. And I think you said something really great that um, that even when you're speaking to non-technical people, when you give it in terms of a story, it's a better way of reaching them. So if, if I know I'm speaking to non-technical people about a technical subject, I'm going to change the way I give the presentation. So, yeah, I think that's probably the key thing is to know who you're talking to and why they came to your presentation. Yep, that's that's a hundred percent true, Richard. I know when I first started giving presentations, I had to give them in front of senior management. Many of them were non-technical. I didn't take into the fact that they were non-technical when I put these presentations together, <laughs> and I, I definitely saw the the problems that ensued. And you thought I would have learned my lesson the first time, or maybe even the second, or maybe even the third, maybe the fourth. Nah, 
No, <laughs> my project had to get canceled, Richard, for me to learn my lesson. <laughs> You know, maybe we'll see you're going to right? push it through. They're going to get this. <laughs> they're gonna get, no. no, they won't. No, no they, they won't. won't. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe this is something I need to get better at. Right? You know, this whole <laughs> canceling project thing, I ain't, I ain't with this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Richard, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for being a guest. How can people get in touch with you? Sure. Well, um, you can reach me at my website, um, I actually, you know what, the, the easiest thing is really just to uh, contact me at my um, email address, which is simply rich.page, R-I-C-H dot P-A-G-E zero six at yahoo.com. It's really the best way to reach me. Um, you can also send me a text. Uh, if you'd like, uh, at the number 321-537-1637. Just text me if, if you'd like to get in contact. Uh, I love contacting people and sharing uh, information, sharing knowledge. It's the heart of a teacher. And, and Neil, I, I know that you doing what you're doing is you're what you're really doing, sir, is you're really sharing your heart. Um, you're really sharing with people your love of of not just passing on information, but seeing how what you're passing on is affecting the lives of other people. And I found that to be uh, the, the truth in that in that presentation with those Air Force guys looking out and seeing people smile. They're wearing their uniforms. They're sitting next to my leaders and they're smiling. And and oh, my, uh, you can see. It was a life-changing moment for me. Wonderful. Well, everyone, that marks the end of another edition of, of the Teach the Geek interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I'm the founder of Teach the Geek. I work with technical professionals so they can present more effectively, especially in front of non-technical audiences. And you can learn more about that at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Until next time, take care and stay safe. Thanks, Richard.